This is Epicenter, episode 379 with guest Munib Ali. Hi, I'm Sebastian Cuchillo, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcast. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Munib Ali. We had Munib on over five years ago on episode 101. And back then, he was working on a project called One Name, which was a sort of decentralized identity system where one could register usernames and domain names. That project has evolved in a pretty drastic way to become Stax. And Stax is a smart contract platform that is built on top of Bitcoin. It is powered by Bitcoin. In the world of smart contract platforms, there are just a handful of projects that leverage Bitcoin for security. And Stack positions itself not as a sidechain, but as a layer one chain that shares the Bitcoin compute power for security. They just launched Stacks 2.0, which introduces full smart contract capabilities with their native programming language, Clarity. And as you'll learn in this conversation, Clarity has some interesting design differences to Solidity and the way that we think about code execution on Ethereum. So I really like to see platform projects building on Bitcoin. There's an enormous amount of value and capital in Bitcoin that just isn't productive. It's sitting there and it's hodling. Projects like Stacks makes it possible for Bitcoin to finance ecosystems in a way that feels much more native and intuitive than wrapped tokens on Ethereum. And in the case of Bitcoin, that's like a trillion dollars of capital that could potentially finance an ecosystem of DeFi and Web3 apps. So I'm hopeful to see projects like Stacks gain traction and become successful because it can just grow the DeFi ecosystem in a pretty exponential way. If you need to make a swap, look no further than one inch. It's my go-to DEX aggregator, and I know that when I use one inch, I'm getting the best price across all DEXs and AMMs. They recently did an airdrop, and the One Inch Foundation has distributed more one inch tokens. You can learn more about that on their blog. Or if you want to use one inch, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. And with that, here's our conversation with Munib Ali. We're here today with Munib Ali. He is the one of the co-founders of the Blockstack or Stacks project and the CEO of a company called Hero. Mani was on the show quite a long time ago, over five years ago, working on talking about the same project actually, but you know, on many iterations ago. And back then it was called One Name. And so, you know, it's really great to have, you know, have a lot of the old veterans back on the show to give updates on, you know, the state of what they're working on. So uh, Mani, it's great to have you back on again. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So yeah, can you give us a little bit, you know, maybe give us a little bit of a recap of your background because, you know, I'm not sure how many of the same listeners we have from five years ago. So uh, for those who haven't watched that previous episode, how did you sort of get involved into crypto and this whole blockchain thing? Yes. Yeah, so my background is actually uh, in computer science. Um, I did a, a PhD in, in distributed systems at Princeton University. And this is where the project kind of like started as well at the, at the computer science department at, at Princeton. And we were actually focusing on building kind of like, you know, more secure, uh, more decentralized internet infrastructure, like internet protocols, not, not nothing to do with crypto uh, in, in the beginning, right? And, and my, uh, personally, I've just been doing research work in distributed systems like for 10, 15 years before starting the project. And for people who are not that familiar with distributed systems, think of that as uh, the, the computer scientists who work on internet protocols or operating systems or these large scale network systems like data centers and so on. So I, I, I was pretty much working on cloud computing effectively uh, during the early part of my, my grad school and then uh, got, got pulled into kind of like this uh, really ambitious idea of not just, um, you know, a clean slate next generation internet design, but not doing it in academia. So we have actually seen a bunch of efforts in academia where, you know, the, at Stanford, for example, there was a project called Clean Slate Internet Design, 
they would build prototypes, they would write research papers about it, but it would never really get commercialized or adopted in the real world. And I, I, I always felt that the real challenges are uh, in that step. Like, how do you actually take some of these ideas and get, you know, millions or billions of people out in the world to use it? Otherwise, I think it just feels like you're just you're just sitting in a bubble and you're just in a research lab uh, trying out different ideas. So I think that was that was kind of like the motivation that let's try let's try to uh, take a stab at this very ambitious thing of trying to upgrade the Internet, but do it uh, in the industry. Right. So uh, raise venture capital. And, and interestingly, in the early days, uh, uh, we are very, very uh, fortunate to have people like, you know, Naval Ravikant or uh, Y Combinator and Union Square Ventures who effectively funded us perfectly knowing that, the, that we are hacking on open source technology and we have no business models in mind for like 10 plus years, right? Like this is this was the pitch, right? Like we are, we are building like this technology in a completely open source way. And if it's successful, like it would uh, likely have an ecosystem around it. Uh, but, you know, it's not like, you know, we have any sense of any business models. We're not, 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 it's, it's almost like a R and D project at, at that time. And they were, uh, they were very supportive in even funding that from a, from a venture uh, perspective. How long ago, ago did you guys start the project? So this is summer of 2013. Uh, for people who measure time in Bitcoin, uh, if Bitcoin was at ninety dollars at that at that time. <laughs> so we last had you on five years ago, which is fifty years in normal time. Tell tell us about what happened uh, since twenty fifteen. Yes, so I think um, to continue the story a little bit, um, we we quickly discovered blockchains, and the and we discovered blockchains as a very elegant solution. For some of the problems that we were trying to solve right so imagine if you're trying to build like a more secure more decentralized uh, dns system domain name system right or you're trying to figure out uh, more secure ways of distributing um, your cryptographic keys on the internet uh, like the blockchains have very natural elegant solutions for these things and we, we discovered blockchains and were super excited about it uh, kind of like started digging deeper into how blockchains can be used for, for solving some of these problems. And interestingly, um, at that time, uh, we, we obviously, you know, there was Bitcoin, but then there were some Bitcoin forks as well. This is this is pre-Ethereum, right? Ethereum, Ethereum did not exist at that time. I, I read the white paper. It was not public, public the white paper at that time, but I, someone, someone sent it to me privately. And uh, there was a fork of Bitcoin called Namecoin, which is still around. It's, it's like a semi-dead project at this point, but you know it, it, it's still around. But it used to be kind of like the number two or number three altcoin on on coin market cap back then. And interestingly, uh, the choices in front of us were: should we directly use Bitcoin? Should we build a separate network, which is which is what Ethereum did, or should we? Uh, build on something that is kind of like sharing the compute power of Bitcoin, which is which is like what Namecoin was doing with merge mining, right? And there are different design trade-offs uh, for, for these approaches. And the way we kind of like thought about it is, uh, interestingly, it's actually easier to build a separate network, right? So what we we're seeing a bunch of blockchains being built out and 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 you know, it's amazing. I'm not saying building a blockchain is easy. <laughs> building a blockchain takes takes a lot of effort and careful designing, and there's con consensus problems to solve. But connecting two different blockchains together in consensus is actually a harder problem, especially when one of them uh, cannot be changed at all. So that's Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin has this very uh, it's it's a great property that Bitcoin has that Bitcoin is not going to change. Right. So if you want to work with Bitcoin, you need to figure out how to work with it without changing it. Right. And that actually makes things much, much harder. So at that time, we were exploring uh, effectively merge mining type techniques that can we start building these uh, domain name systems or PKI systems, uh, but still somehow share the uh, compute power of Bitcoin, and there were like we we can go into some of those challenges, but at, at a high level, there were many uh, technical challenges with, with with that approach. 
And we, the second iteration, the, the first iteration, I would say it didn't last very long, right? We quickly discovered uh, the problems with approaches like name coin or, or merge mining. And the first real iteration, which was Stacks 1.0, was actually directly built on top of Bitcoin. We actually knew that this is, in the grand scheme of things, not a very scalable design because every Stacks transaction is a Bitcoin transaction, right? So if a million domain names get registered on Stacks, a million Bitcoin transactions happen, right? And then the Bitcoin... Uh, core developers weren't like truly kind of like excited about it. We, at one point, we were the largest uh, consumer of uh, op return um, transactions. Op return is like you embed this additional data in, in Bitcoin transactions. So you're basically using Bitcoin for other purposes. Like you're not really doing uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin to Bitcoin transfers. You're actually just using the additional embedded data. And we, we built like Stacks 1.0 is like, uh, think of it as a virtual blockchain. Like it's a blockchain built on top of, top of Bitcoin. And that, that has limitations, like it did not have a full, a full smart contract language. It obviously had scalability limitations because it's tied with Bitcoin. And, but back then, like back when this was launched in like 2015 or so, it wasn't clear how Bitcoin is going to scale, right? Like this is pre the fork wars, right? Even though we, we thought that Bitcoin would always be used as a settlement layer, that was the camp we were in. It was kind of like still a, a question in the industry that uh, can Bitcoin actually take more data right at the base layer? And now it's abundantly clear that no, Bitcoin is not going to take additional data. So I, I would say around 2017 or so, we started uh, working on the Stacks 2.0 design. So it's actually been like three years in the making. And interestingly, I think this is, this is where uh, this becomes very fascinating. It goes back to the original design decision of 2013. Do you build a separate network? Do you build on Bitcoin or do you somehow share the compute power of Bitcoin? And I think that we have cracked the problem uh, this time around with Stacks 2.0, where it shares the compute power of Bitcoin, but it is not dependent. Like the scalability is completely disconnected uh, from Bitcoin. It can scale independently of Bitcoin and uh, it can have full smart contract languages. So when you, when you say that it's, build on Bitcoin, what you mean is that it's kind of, it's a separate change, a chain that kind of checkpoints into Bitcoin for finality purposes. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit more than that, right? So think of that as it's not a side chain, like from a traditional definition of a side chain, but we, we, we one way to think of that is, is it's like a layer one blockchain that directly connects with Bitcoin. Right. So what I mean by that is there's actually consensus between two blockchains. Right. Uh, sure, our Stacks blockchain has consensus internally as well, but it has consensus between Bitcoin. And how, how that happens is that in terms of uh, you're, you're right about the checkpoint thing, but the, the, the way it works is that you can do thousands of transactions on the Stacks blockchain and they automatically settle on Bitcoin every Bitcoin block. Right. So for people who are familiar with uh, with Lightning, think of that as uh, Lightning channels that are settling on Bitcoin, every Bitcoin block automatically. And, and, and the way they, the consensus works is that the miners of the Stacks blockchain, they actually view the state of both Bitcoin and Stacks. They're competing to become a miner using the Bitcoin blockchain. But if they win, so there's a verifiable random function on Bitcoin, they're sending transactions on Bitcoin to participate in leader election, right? So they're actually bidding, bidding in Bitcoin uh, to, to win a block. And the miner that wins a block writes a stacks block, right? Because they have visibility into both, right? And there, there, there's consensus uh, in between both. So the interesting thing that happens is, that uh, let me let me uh, sh share some stats here. I think in the first two thousand uh, blocks of uh, of our blockchain, so it launched around January fourteenth. What we've seen is miners have sent something like you know close to twenty five thousand transactions just for these Bitcoin commits, right? They're they're competing. They're trying to commit Bitcoin, and they have spent something like forty three Bitcoin, which is like around one point five million dollars. 
in that competition, right? And it, and it, what, what, what's happening is that the value of a Stacks block, it, they're bidding on that value in Bitcoin directly on the Bitcoin chain, right? Instead of uh, having hardware and ASICs and burning electricity to compete for for mining a block, right? And and that's that's super interesting because what that does is it says that you don't need a separate proof of work chain. You can reuse. You can actually ride on the the Bitcoin's uh, proof of work. If you, we are using Bitcoin, uh, the asset, as a proof of computation, right? And we shared the security of Bitcoin because the way our, our consensus works, if someone wants to come in and change the history of stacks, they would actually go and attack Bitcoin and reorg Bitcoin, which, you know, like good luck with that. That is the, by far the most secure secure system out there. So that's 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 kind of like this works and there's more to it and we're happy, happy to dive a little bit uh, more, more into the algorithm. One inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. One inch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using one inch last summer and since then it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm. And my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. How exactly do these bids work? Like, so let's say I want to be a block producer uh, and, and like create stacks blocks. How do I become the leader for this round? So the way this works is that you're effectively, you can look at historical data to see, you know, what, at, at what level of bidding are people actually winning blocks, right? Because, and, and, and then uh, there's also a smoothing function uh, in the sense that we don't want uh, miners to uh, come in very quickly and then stop mining very quickly. We want there to be some sort of a smoothing function because in, the bids are actually going to depend on the STX BTC price pair on exchanges. Some of the miners, I can tell you, that they model mining as a uh, almost like a DEX, where they're looking at uh, the BTC STX price pair, and they want to mine if they can get a cheaper rate than the Binance STX BTC price or you know some other exchanges BTC price. So they, they view this as an ARB opportunity. So miners will only mine if they can get cheaper STX from mining than whatever is the ongoing real-time uh, trading rate uh, outside. And plus, obviously, there, uh, there are more details there because you're not, there's some delay in them actually getting the STX and there are other, other complexity involved. But at a high level, you can model that as a, as a DEX running on Bitcoin, right? And in the process of trying to uh, buy up the STX that's being released. The consensus is a byproduct of that. But so, how how does the bid actually work? Like, do I send Bitcoin to a particular address? And so, and if so, if I don't get, if I'm not the winner of the auction, how do I get my bid back? So first, I'll explain the concepts with just a burn address, right? So imagine that all the bids are going to a burn address and, and Bitcoin is being burnt. And what's happening is that uh, there is a verifiable random function and it, it effectively looks at uh, if you burn more Bitcoin, your probability of winning goes up, but it, it, is, it is still a VRF, right? So it's, it's, you're not guaranteed. Your probability goes up, but you're not guaranteed to win. So then, and it's over a window as well, right? So what happens is in, in any given block, the, the verifiable random function basically spits out who the winner is, right? 
and that winner gets to write the, the stacks block and collect the uh, Coinbase fees, the newly minted tokens from stacks and the Clarity smart contract fees and the transaction fees uh, from stacks. So that is the value of the block uh, for, for the miner. But then this is a lot of Bitcoin being destroyed, right? So we worked on a improvement where we were like, instead, like for, for example, just in the first 2000 blocks, like $1.5 million worth of Bitcoin would have been destroyed. So we worked on a improvement where the miners can actually agree on a set of Bitcoin addresses, uh, which are the reward addresses. And these are people who hold the Stacks cryptocurrency on the Stacks blockchain. And they also want to participate in consensus, right? So they are participating at a lower level, right? They are effectively locking up capital on the, on the dominant fork, right? And when they send out this transaction to lock STX, they're broadcasting useful uh, network information, right? So th these people become like active participants in consensus. We're basically saying, here is the state of the blockchain that I see, and I want to lock my capital on the on what I think is the correct fork of the network, right? And they and they give out the Bitcoin address as part of that. It's very interesting because the mechanism itself is written as a Clarity contract, so people can actually see it. It's a call to a Clarity contract where you are locking STX, and it, and every cycle is uh, a cycle is roughly two weeks. It's two thousand blocks, so the minimum time to lock is two thousand blocks, and now the Bitcoin. Uh, so based on kind of like the last, almost like the registration period, we get a set of addresses and the miners are now sending transactions to, to those addresses, right? And interestingly, the load on Bitcoin is in the order of the number of miners, right? So if there are, let's say 20 miners who are competing, Bitcoin is going to see 20 transactions per block, right? Independent of, if Stacks is doing a thousand transactions or five thousand transactions, the 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 load on Bitcoin is in the order of the miners, right? Which which is a very very interesting property to have, and in some ways the the hash power of the Stacks chain is represented in Bitcoin, and the Stacks holders are getting that Bitcoin, right? So we were we were actually seeing when people started getting Bitcoin directly from miners, like. People were like, this is a magical experience, right? Like there, there, there are some tweets out there where people are, have, have posted videos of small Bitcoin transactions just showing up or, you know, there were, there were some people who were like, I woke up to like 10 emails from my Coinbase account that you have received Bitcoin, you have received Bitcoin. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting experience because, because all you're doing is giving a Bitcoin address. It's compatible with every Bitcoin wallet and exchange in the world already. Uh, and, and that's how you're kind of like earning Bitcoin from, from consensus. I just want to understand. So the stacks holders, how, so what they're basically putting locking coins and saying that, Hey, I think that this fork is the valid one. That part doesn't happen on the Bitcoin chain. That's happening on the stack chain. So, so, but in that case, if there's a, a fork of the stacks chain, wouldn't the same people be able to say, well, I don't know which one. I mean, this comes back to like the traditional proof of stake, like nothing at stake problem where it's like, well, I might as well just lock on both sides of the fork. Meanwhile, if there's a way to lock on Bitcoin, then that would be. Yes. You know, so this, this is, um, this is not a, a critical part of our consensus, right? The miners are only responsible for consensus. What this is, think of that as a additional information where that helps is it actually helps honest miners, right? People who are honest miners, they can actually tell where the majority of the users of the blockchain are, right? But it, it, from a, from a pure consensus point of view, like it, it actually, you know, does not impact consensus in that sense, other than giving additional useful information to the honest miners. I would also like to backtrack here a little bit. So you said if there's 20 miners, there'll be 20 transactions on the Bitcoin chain. So how many concurrent miners do you expect there to be? Because basically on, on Bitcoin and Ethereum and other large chain, there's much, many more than 20 concurrent miners, right? 
Yeah, so we have actually seen, um, you know, quite quite a large number of miners as well. Like on the test net, we got like 800 miners and, and so on. On the on the production network, we've seen 80 plus uh, miners. I think 46 have successfully mined or something like that. But interestingly, just just like how, how mining typically works, even in Bitcoin, our expectation is that a handful of really sophisticated miners will control you know some percent of 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 mining rewards, and then there might be mining pools as well, right? And then there are long tail of small miners. So I think in in that sense, like if you look at that distribution for Bitcoin, let's say you ignore the ignore the the very very small folks, you just look at who the big miners are or who the big pools are. Like it, you you basically get a handful of uh, of miners in a in a in a steady state, right? And which is which is something uh, that that might happen on Saks of well. It's it's effectively modeled modeled after after Bitcoin. And the block rate. Is larger for stacks than for Bitcoin, right? So basically, you have you have many more blocks. Each Bitcoin blocks corresponds to many stacks blocks. So um, how do I bid? Do I bid on a specific block, or do I bid on the right to mine the next fifteen minutes worth of blocks, or how does this work? Yeah, so we we have this concept of micro blocks. So to keep things simple. Stacks blocks have a one-to-one -one correspondence with Bitcoin, right? But we have further divided the stacks block into micro blocks, and and you can uh, so micro blocks, interestingly, also get confirmations. These confirmations have nothing much to do with with Bitcoin. Basically, think of that as you're a user, you broadcast a transaction on stacks, it will very quickly get picked up by a stacks miner and get included in a micro block, right? And then, you know, and, and, and micro blocks are, are a little bit different. Only the winner of the last stacks block can produce micro blocks. And, and so a, a micro block is like, you know, the last winner is just going like boom, boom, boom. And they keep producing blocks, let's say six, seven, eight, depending on, you know, how long Bitcoin is taking to produce a block. Let's say a, a micro block is every, call it 30 seconds. But once I'm in the micro block, am I in or is it kind of like a snapshot of the mempool? Yes. So, so that that interestingly is a how you can we can display that information to the user as basically other miners can include the micro block in their Bitcoin commits as well. So, what, what, what's what's happening on Bitcoin is that people are very quickly doing replace by fee. The miners are doing replace by fee to always have the updated information and the updated uh, micro block in there. But you can actually just look at the Bitcoin mempool and know that the probability of, of your transaction getting confirmed is actually close to 100% because all of the, of the stacks miners have you in their micro block. And then there are incentives there where a percent of the rewards are based on including micro blocks in your transaction, like for the, for the other miners, for the miners who don't even win the, the main block. They are incentivized to include as many micro blocks in there as as possible, right? So we it's it's a little bit of a game theory there, but it's it's, it's pretty interesting. Like I would say, like ni in ninety nine percent of the cases, like as soon as you get a single confirmation on a micro block, like your transaction is getting in because every single miner is incentivized to include it on the whoever wins the Bitcoin block. Like they would have you in 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 their micro blocks. But let's say uh, okay, so let's say half the miners end up not seeing one of the micro blocks on time. And so half the miners with their bids, they included up to micro block number 100, while half of them included micro block 101. Which one now, so now a new leader is selected. Uh, they continue to build off of the one that they saw, off of the bid that was in their thing, or do they have to like take, you know, whatever the majority of the miners picked, or how does that work? So this is this is where we separate kind of like confirmations from finality. Finality is only driven by Bitcoin. So whoever was the miner who wrote the Bitcoin block, basically you will you will see one finality effectively, right? And then Bitcoin confirmations are kind of like finality numbers. Once once they reach high enough, like there are guarantees that nothing nothing can roll back on on stacks. 
So if you if you have someone determined who is allowed to mine your next block, how do you deal with them, the threat of them censoring transactions? So interestingly, we when, when thinking about censoring transactions, uh, we have this really cool feature where people can actually send stacks transactions on the Bitcoin network as well. So uh, transfer transactions and uh, locking up, uh, we call it stacking. So if you want to lock up your uh, your stacks to participate, they're supported in Bitcoin and more uh, forms can be supported as well. So if you're afraid that, hey, someone is not going to let me transfer my stacks or not going to let me participate in stacking, you can actually just broadcast transactions on the Bitcoin chain and they will get picked up in consensus. And I think that's actually pretty beautiful because it's Bitcoin as a backup communication channel if you are afraid of censorship. What about from the other direction? Um, Bitcoin miners basically censoring all stacks bid so that way, like as the as a Bitcoin miner, I can guarantee that I win this stacks bid as well. Yeah, so we, we did a bunch of work there. Like I think there's there's very interesting um, game theory. So think of it this way that first of all, the transactions are Bitcoin transfer transactions, right? So it's it's, it's unlikely that uh, these types of transactions will get banned on Bitcoin altogether, right? Because it, we are just doing transfers on, on the Bitcoin chain. And then uh, if a miner, let's say, wants to play around with the stacks chain and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to censor other people and just have my own bid in there. I think, A, that's where the rolling window comes in. That miner would actually have to try and control things for several blocks, right, to have a real shot at, at winning, winning the block. And, and secondly, it then it starts getting into collusion with other miners, right? Because if other Bitcoin miners are not, not doing the same thing, what would happen is that uh, you will see one block in which a miner was actually not letting in other stacks miners, but because of the, the window, that even that block doesn't really impact how the, uh, the VRF works. That miner would have to control a, a long number of consecutive blocks, which is a very hard thing to do on, on, on Bitcoin, right? And interestingly, uh, another version of, of, uh, of this is that what if, you know, Bitcoin miners think that this is very profitable, why don't we mine the, the uh, stack chain, right? And not let anyone else mine. So the worst case scenario here, absolute worst case scenario, if you work out uh, kind of like the game theory, is uh, every Bitcoin miner is also a stacks miner. You turn into a merge mine chain, essentially. <laughs> it, it, it turns into uh, a condition where 100% of the Bitcoin miners are the stacks miners and they're not letting anyone else mine, but which is fine because if you consider Bitcoin mining to be decentralized, it's basically like an additional requirement to mine the stacks chain at that point that to, to mine the stacks chain, you also need to be a miner on Bitcoin. Right? But that is the worst case scenario, which, which I'm, I'm very, very comfortable with. But that is like basically a similar security as like merge mining, right? It would tur essentially turns into merge mining. In, in some sense, yeah. So how does the stacks chain deal with re on the Bitcoin level? So I think in, in general, Bitcoin dictates the, the finality, right? So if Bitcoin forks, stacks forks with it. And whatever fork win wins on Bitcoin is the source of truth for, for stacks. That, and that's how it's designed, right? Like it's basically, it's designed to use Bitcoin as a settlement layer and as a source of truth. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a very clear cut answer and uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So the Stacks blockchain can do more things natively than the Bitcoin blockchain. So it, I mean, you have a smart uh, contracting um, script. Can we talk about that for a while? The language is called Clarity. Um, so what are its list base as far as I, uh, as far as I know? Um, so what are the benefits of clarity over something like uh, solidity? Yeah, so I think this goes back to, again, uh, fundamental design decisions. Like just like there's a fundamental design decision that do you want to build on Bitcoin and use Bitcoin's proof of work or do you want to build a separate network, right? Like once you make that decision, it's a type one uh, uh, type decision. Same with... Um, uh, the design of the, of the language, right? If you decide 
that you want to have a Turing complete language like 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 Solidity, you know, it's it's very hard hard to roll that back when right? you're going to live with it for a, for a very very long time. And we have always been in the camp, just like we've been in the camp that the broader thesis here is Bitcoin has network effects. Any experiments that we are seeing in other blockchains will eventually get created on top of Bitcoin, right? So just like the early internet, there were a bunch of separate networks, but in the end, you know, TCP IP and the internet ended up taking all the, all the traffic. We think Bitcoin is like TCP IP and all these other things will end up getting built on top, right? Like maybe not in that extreme of a form, that you know everything else disappears and there's only bitcoin and things on top of bitcoin but i'm talking about the bulk of the market right like uh, that's our thesis so on the on the uh, smart contract language side we are in the camp that the only thing that matters for small smart contract in the long run right in, in the long run is the security properties of the language because the unique thing here is that the smart contract run on a blockchain you know they cannot be modified once they're deployed and you get people are keeping hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of crypto assets on these computer programs, right? So being able to reason about the security models and give formal verifications uh, for for the, the smart contracts and basically just, just optimize for security. Don't optimize for anything else other than security. Like that, that, that is really the thesis. So uh, yes, it's a list-based language, but that's more of a syntax thing. The design principle is we don't want a Turing complete language, but we want to have a language that's uh, general enough that most of the programs can can be written. Right. That's where we started. Then we took pretty uh, contrarian uh, decisions like, uh, for example, we don't even have a compiler. We don't want to have a compiler. We explicitly wanted to avoid having a compiler because even a compiler can actually introduce unwanted bugs into your code, right? Like what, because what you're publishing in, in, in blockchains, like code is law, but what people are publishing is actually compiled code. So they don't even know if the thing that they think is law is doing the, the thing that they, they want it to do, right? Yeah, very few people can read bad code. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we actually publish um, source code, which is, which is interpreted instead of compiled. You can, you can even compile it locally for performance reasons or whatever, but it's, it's interpreted, which means that in the blockchain, like if you go to our explorer, you can actually see and read the code and the comments in there as well, which I think is a much better UX experience as well, other, other than the benefits of knowing exactly what it is. But then the, the interesting part and most of the work uh, behind Clarity was to ensuring that we don't introduce Turing completeness by mistake, right? Because, because you can do that. In, in a design of, of a language. So you have to be very precise about everything. Like how are you even mapping out, you know, uh, some, some storage internally uh, and, and, and effectively what that translates into is just like in Ethereum or Solidity, uh, there is a gas estimate. It's an estimate because you don't know what the program is going to do, right? And, and what, what is exactly going to execute and when it executes, then you know uh, what the fee was. In Clarity, there's no estimate. There's precise fee because you know, even before executing the program, exactly precisely what the program is going to do, right? And that, I think that is the night and day difference in the two designs where uh, in the industry right now, what's happening is people realize that his smart contracts are important. Let's just get a lot of manual audits on the code. Or they would try to uh, have some sort of a formal verification by writing additional code, additional syntax, and then doing partial uh, uh, verification on that code base, what we are saying is yes, obviously, you know, manual audits are great, but you get formal verification out of the box just based on how the programming language is designed. And I think that's a that's a major uh, major win for developers who care about the security of the, of the smart contracts. So this this is like some middle ground though between like the language is not, can be non turing complete but you're saying that there's like no need for gas estimates but don't you have can't you still have cases where there's like race conditions and stuff that like you know basically you know you make a transaction expecting it to do one thing but maybe someone else did a transaction that changes how your transaction acts do you not have that kind of situation happening on here or do you avoid that as well using like 
I don't know, UTXOs or something like that? No, it's a it's an account based system, but I think we'll we'll have to dig deeper into like what 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 that example is. But think think of this way that it's about execution paths, right? So you can calculate like the exact execution paths for what the program can potentially take, right? So you know, let's say let's say that you are attaching the precise fee for the longest possible execution path. Okay, you can still have different potential execution paths, but at least we can bound the potential paths but given given the given a state given an input state you know precisely what will happen with the with the program right yeah the problem is we don't always know what the input state is because other people can make transactions before you i mean that's exactly the same problem as on ethereum right i mean because it's a stateful chain you don't always know what the state is that uh, your your transaction is going to act upon Right, but I think I think over there, uh, the 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 Turing completeness actually adds a lot of ambiguity, right? Because it, it, in theory, like you are, it's a, it's a Turing complete language, so it's very hard to actually do formal formal verification on it. It's impossible to upper bound the gas costs, while here at least you can buy. You know, you can take all the different code paths, and you can at least say here is the like upper bound by like this, like, you know, provably this is the upper bound, which is, I guess, not possible in a true and complete language. Right. Can I go back one step? Seeing that Clarity is not a true and complete language, what are the sort of computations that Clarity cannot do when compared to something like Solidity? Yeah, I can give you a very simple example, right? Like, for example, it doesn't have loops. But interestingly, you can write most programs without loops. Like, you can just write the same type of logic without without using loops. And then uh, we get a lot of questions around, hey, can you actually call other contracts? And the answer is yes, you can call other contracts, but there's no re-entrancy, right? Re- re-entrancy does not exist. So it's, it's a little bit like, you can even, like if, if you really want quote unquote loops, you can actually write a separate contract and then just like call it a bunch of times, right? So it's a, like the developers need to like get into the mindset of like how, to write this code, but once you pick that up, like uh, we actually ran an experiment, right? Like for uh, four months before launching Stacks 2.0, uh, we were doing a bunch of hackathons with the goal of like, let's try to get developers to build like some of the more popular smart contracts on Ethereum. Mostly from the lens of like, uh, do we need to change clarity in some way or add certain features and so on? And interestingly, the developers were actually pretty easily able to build literally every every major uh, uh, Solidity contract, right? And yes, it was informative, like we, we wanted to add certain changes. And in fact, we, we, we ended up doing some, something pretty interesting uh, because a change to Clarity language is actually a hard fork to the Stacks blockchain. So we don't expect Clarity to change that much, but we were able to figure out this, this very interesting way where you could implement a Clarity feature or enhancement in Clarity itself, which is not a hard fork, it's just that that function will be slow. And if that that thing is getting usage, then in a future hard fork, you could have a native implementation, right? So one of the learnings from this this, this hackathon process was that, okay, maybe, maybe there's something that Clarity doesn't have right now and people feel the need for it. Well, maybe they can just write it in Clarity itself and down the road, you can optimize it uh, by, by, by making it faster. Do you foresee that like Clarity will become like the language that people write in? Or do you think that there's going to be higher languages that then compile down to Clarity? Because I noticed in your GitHub, you have a uh, language called Clarity Script, which is actually like a, like a JavaScript, yep. JavaScript-esque language that compiles to it. I looked at Clarity and it seems to be like Lisp language, which is like, you know, has all these nice properties, but at the same time, it's like definitely much harder for like, beginner developers to approach. And so what's the strategy there? My preference would be that people people just learn it, right? <laughs> because it's a, it, it takes a little bit, little bit of time, but I can see why um, there can be a learning curve as well. Like the way I'm thinking about this is to write smart contracts, you have to go through a learning curve. Like you have to understand what the smart contracts are, right? 
I know, I know that there are approaches in industry where they're just trying to use like Rust as a uh, programming language or even even C as a smart contract programming language. I just I just disagree. I think people actually in the process of learning why clarity is different, like they would actually learn the reasons for how smart contracts are different from normal programs. But realistically, like so uh, uh, clarity script is not the only only one. I think there were some uh, people in the RV community we're actually trying to write similar like JavaScript to Clarity uh, trans trans compilers and, and so on. So I think that's already happening, right? People people have their preference for what language they want to use. And there might be like these these this compilation step, right? Like you go from that language to Clarity. But I think in terms of what I would like to see is I would like to see more education material of when someone is just learning how to program like telling them that why doing things this way uh, is different from from, from d- doing things in, in the other solidity type world. Now, going back a little bit to architecture of the chain itself, one of the, like, the main sort of taglines that's used here is it's like that it's built on Bitcoin, Stacks is built on Bitcoin. And so after going through this whole discussion about the consensus protocol, I, I, I definitely see in what why this is sort of inherits its consensus security from Bitcoin in more in a way that like something like uh, a, a separate chat network like Ethereum does not. But from an application perspective, does a stack smart contract have any different relationship to Bitcoin the asset than an Ethereum smart contract might? Because, you know, with Ethereum, we have we have like wrapped Bitcoin or like TBTC on Ethereum, and we've had BTC relay for you know number of years at this point. And so, from that application level perspective, how is this more Bitcoin native than something like Bitcoin on Ethereum? So that that that's that's the second biggest thing of Clarity, right? That uh, that I was going to get into, and that is that Clarity has uh, full visibility into Bitcoin state, right? So Clarity has native Bitcoin SPV proofs, and it has, just like I mentioned earlier, that we can use Bitcoin as a backup channel to even do transactions, like Stacks transactions that show up in consensus on the Stacks chain through Bitcoin. Similarly, whatever is happening on Bitcoin is available to programmers in Clarity, right? So that, that, let me let me walk you through a very simple program where, you know, let's say, I want to do uh, donations to Coin Center, and I say that you know uh, here's like twenty thousand stacks. I like up to twenty thousand stacks. I want to donate to Coin Center, and uh, based on how many Bitcoin donations go to this Bitcoin address, I will match an additional amount, and I can write that as a Clarity smart contract. People are sending transactions to Bitcoin address. For, for Coin Center, right? They they don't even need to know about Clarity or Stacks. The Stacks contract automatically knows the state of that Bitcoin address, and if it triggers that like, hey now you know X amount of Bitcoin has been donated, it can send a transaction on on Stacks for the additional donation to Coin Center, right? So you can, you're writing logic that is triggered by changes on Bitcoin. That's I think super interesting, and then you can you can look at the reverse of that as well, right? So this functionality that I described, like it's it's live today, right? Like you you have full visibility into Bitcoin, you have Bitcoin SPV proofs natively available uh, in Clarity, but the reverse path is actually even more powerful, where a Clarity contract can trigger a change in the Bitcoin state, right? That work is more in the R and D stages. And we are looking at various Bitcoin uh, scripts where, you know, let's say an ideal example would be you lock up your Bitcoin in a, some sort of a time lock. And there's logic that executes on the Clarity side that when that program, Clarity program basically finishes executing, it can actually trigger where the unlocked Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain is going to go. Once you have that, now you have write capability to Bitcoin as well. That, that is super powerful. Mm-hmm. And so what are some of the like techniques being used, uh, you know, even in the R&D stage to like do that? Yeah, I think I think that, that's super early. We were uh, we were focused on building, <laughs> building out the stack 
uh, mainnet at this point, but you know, we will we'll look at you know hash time logs. We'll look at Taproot. We'll look at you know all there. There are a bunch of like interesting other new newer projects as, as well. I know I know uh, J- Jeremy Rubin has has been working on like some some sort of a more advanced scripting language on the Bitcoin side. So we are we are exploring all of that. To basically, see what can be done to in a way kind of like connect clarity with uh, with state changes on on Bitcoin, and 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 then. Going to the example of kind of like, you know, Ethereum and wrapped assets there, it's a little bit like if you are moving a wrapped asset on a disconnected chain, like it has nothing to do with Bitcoin at that point, right? Any asset that you're creating on Stacks is effectively secured by Bitcoin. Like let, let, let's, let's take the example of a, a NFT. There's an app called Boom. People are creating NFTs there. Those NFTs are actually literally secured by Bitcoin. Like you can see that here is the... Stacks transaction, here's how it got packaged up and here's here are the hashes on, on the Bitcoin chain for it. So so I think in my view, a NFT issued on, on Bitcoin is more valuable because it's more durable. And similarly, other types of digital assets issued on the Stacks chain, they're 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 directly getting uh, secured by Bitcoin as well. But so that means though at the moment there's no way of transferring Bitcoin onto the stacks chain because I think one of the main like things that people are want right now is the ability to use Bitcoin in DeFi, use it as collateral in different DeFi things. And so right now, stacks doesn't enable that yet until the work on like having the other direction is completed, right? Yes. So I think what's happening there is that there's a spectrum of solutions, right? One is the custodial approach, like just like you have wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum, uh, Tokensoft and Anchorage have announced that they plan to have a wrapped Bitcoin asset on Stacks. And again, the only kind of like real benefit you're getting is that asset itself is secured by Bitcoin, right? So if you don't trust the consensus or security of other chains, at least you have the peace of mind that this, this thing is being being secured by Bitcoin. The next level from that is uh, keep network type approaches, right? Where there's there's some sort of a more decentralized way of moving an asset into the chain. But the the extreme end of the spectrum is the ideal world where the user experience is you just lock up Bitcoin on Bitcoin and use it on Stacks. And then when you're done using it on Stacks, they just unlock on Bitcoin, right? Like that's the, that, that is the dream world, right? Like where that's the thing that everyone wants, where it's like a more seamless kind of like, I just locked Bitcoin on Bitcoin, used it in the, in the stack chain, took them back, or they, they go to somebody else. If, you know, uh, the ownership uh, of Bitcoin has actually changed hands on during, during the time it was in the stack chain. So the other offering that builds a similar offering on top of uh, Bitcoin is uh, Rootstack, right? Um, so h- how does that uh, compare to Stacks? Yeah, I think, first of all, I love to see uh, innovation around Bitcoin, uh, the people who are trying to do different things on Bitcoin. That's always great, great to see. Uh, the two big differences are the consensus mechanism over there is merge mining, right? And I, I mentioned our experience with merge mining on, on Namecoin, where because the merge mine chain is unless you somehow get a hundred percent of the bitcoin miners to also mine the the merge chain the merge mining chain is always like a subset of the main chain and then another kind of like thing that happens is let's say you have a large bitcoin miner that has 35 percent or something of bitcoin if that miner starts mining on the merge mine chain that miner might actually have 60 percent of the of, of the merge chain like we we went through those problems i I found some issues on Namecoin where there was literally a single miner like having 75% of the hash power. Right? And when I when I disclosed those issues, like somehow, you know, the community members were like, we, yeah, we have known about this for a while and that's fine. And like, how is this fine? Right? Like this, this is at this point, a single miner is effectively running the network. Right. So I think, I think there are challenges and then there's practical challenges where of, of the merge mine chain, like it's about incentives. Like what is the incentive for, a very large fraction of the Bitcoin miners to continuously mine this chain, especially when I think the way my understanding is RSK also doesn't have Coinbase rewards, right? So they're really saying that the transaction volume on our chain is going to be so high that every single Bitcoin miner 
will want to mine our chain, right? That would be a great world if we can reach that. But I think getting there has some sort of, you know, initial hurdles and incentive problems. Uh, and secondly, I think the big difference is that they uh, they basically have Solidity and EVM, right? And I would not recommend, you know, young uh, entrepreneurs and engineers who are basically trying to learn program smart contracts to go down that route. Ideally, you know, and many other projects are doing that. We're not the only ones, right? If you look at Tezos, uh, if you look at Algorand, uh, Algorand actually also collaborated with us on Clarity. Like they're in the same camp that these need to be non-Turing complete, much more focused on security type of languages, not not EVM based. I think I think what it, what happened is because Ethereum was early and it got the initial kind of like adopt, adoption. Now there is a little bit like, hey, let's just be compatible with EVM because you know that's like an easier sell to developers. But if someone made the bad decision. Uh, like in the early stages of the industry doesn't mean that the industry needs to live with that decision for for forever like i'm 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 talking 10 years down the road like it'll, i think it'll be a uh, at least in my mind it'll be a pretty pretty sad outcome if people are still fighting kind of like reentrancy and all all these types of like problems uh, in smart contracts instead of just using more more secure languages there are so many options available uh, clarity is not the only one right zilliqa has a, has an interesting approach Tezos has an interesting approach. Um, Algorand, as I said, they have a lower level language and now they're working on Clarity as a, as a higher level language as well. Cool. So let's talk about some of the apps that run on top of um, Stacks 2.0. Can you give us an idea of how many there are and kind of what the popular ones are? Yeah. So I think, uh, first of all, there's a divide between Stacks 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, 1.0 did not have smart contracts. So 1.0 is the chain that was directly on top of Bitcoin. And over there, effectively, the use of the blockchain was effectively to register usernames, uh, domain names, and pointers to storage, right? And then we, then we had a decentralized authentication system. We had, we had the rest of the stack so that people can build uh, things like, you know, decentralized blogging, uh, decentralized photo sharing, like even messaging applications and so on. And we saw a bunch of them. A lot of the, the, that traction goes back to our app mining program, which is, which is a very interesting experiment. Like we, we learned a lot from it. It effectively was a more automated way to incentivize developer behavior that let's say that there are certain metrics uh, based on which you're handing out rewards to developers, right? To kickstart kind of like an app ecosystem so that people are building more applications. Interestingly, what we saw was initially it was working really well, right? Like developers would basically come and build these applications. Like we can even score them on decentralization, right? Like, hey, how decentralized is your app? Or you can just put in like, or, or you can uh, score them on the UX of the app. We had these this process of like multiple reviewers. So let's say there are five independent reviewers who are giving a score on the UX. There is a score for uh, how decentralized the app is. There's a score for you know, how much users an app is getting and so on. And and very quickly, we started seeing that there was almost like some sort of unintended behavior where developers were more interested in just gaming the scores for the rewards versus building, you know, uh, really high quality decentralized applications for the love of it, right? And and looking back, it might actually seem more obvious that, of course, they were just, it's like a, it's like an exam, Right. Are you are you taking the class to actually learn, or are you doing it just to pass the test, right? And there are so many students who are just focused on like I just want to clear the exam and get a get a good grade. I don't care about the learning part. For those reasons, we ended up pausing the app mining program, and it got us like more than 400 applications built on top of the network. Some of them were really high quality, really good apps, but then there was a long tail of people who were effectively, you know, some people would build like 10 applications so that they can have 10 entries. In, in app mining and kind of like get more rewards and, and, and whatnot, but they're not really passionate about any single one of, one of those applications. So that the app mining program has been paused for almost a year now, more than a year. And we have definitely noticed a difference that there's more organic community. Like during the time app mining was running, like we, we, we got a lot more attention. There were a lot more people, but they were basically there for the money, right? Like, like, a, like a good, good quantity of them. But now um, the community feels 
much more organic. The developers are there because they believe in decentralization. They believe in privacy. They believe in, 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 in building on Bitcoin, right? Like building on Bitcoin is a very core kind of like cultural DNA of, of the community that we are building. And I'm, I'm super excited about it. So in terms of apps, you can just go to app.co that has a list of some of the top applications from Stacks 1.0 that are also migrating to Stacks 2.0. They need to up upgrade certain things in the app to migrate to 2.0. Uh, Pravika is a great example. Pravika is a um, almost like a decentralized Zoom plus a decentralized WhatsApp. So you can do messaging and video video calls. And it's, it's amazing, right? Like it's, it, it's like... You look at what's happening in the world, and these are the kind of solutions you're uh, you're looking for. Where there's no company in the middle, it's a completely encrypted uh, video chat session, and you look up the keys for people using their usernames that are registered on the Stacks chain, but then secured by Bitcoin. So with your private key, you can actually just see in which transaction your name was registered, how was it packaged on Bitcoin, and 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 you know that you know no one is going to change the uh, the Bitcoin chain. And then in the newer applications, because Clarity just went live, we are actually seeing there is a uh, project called uh, Swapper, which is like an automated market maker, uh, like like Uniswap, written in Clarity, which would be super interesting to see. There are, there's a project called Dualex. It's like they have you can take a option to buy an asset and trade that, right? Like so, people are trying to now innovate more on the DeFi side of things. And I think the key differentiator, and going back to like what you mentioned earlier, that the, the blockchain has only been live, 2.0 has only been live for like two weeks now. When we can have like more native Bitcoin movement from the Bitcoin chain into the Stacks chain and back and so on. And I think it might happen over phases, like sure, you'll have a custodial approach, you, you might have a semi-decentralized and then a fully decentralized approach and so on. But that means you can inject Bitcoin capital directly into DeFi, it, written in Clarity, which is a secure programming language. And all of this is happening directly on top of Bitcoin in the sense that, you know, all the state for these contracts is eventually getting settled back into Bitcoin. And I think that is a world that, that I'm, I'm, su I'm super excited about. If you look at the Bitcoin community, there's a lot of resistance to any sort of token that's not Bitcoin, right? And a lot of the apps that um, run on top of Stacks 2.0 um, have native tokenomics. Um, so how do you see that playing out? Do you think tokens, I mean, basically in Bitcoin, in many Bitcoin circles, they are de decried as, you know, this money grabbing um, scam. So how do you kind of see these two come together? Or do you see these two come together? Yeah. So I think let me let me tease that apart a little bit. And actually, even before getting into that, like there's one important kind of like thing that we have completely missed from the discussions right now, and that is the ability to earn Bitcoin rewards from consensus. So the stacks holders, when the, when mining is happening, every Bitcoin block, literally Bitcoin is being transferred to the stacks holder, and it's a it's a magical experience, right? Like there were people tweeting about it, they're showing their screenshots of basically getting Bitcoin in their wallet. They can give any wallet address. It could be an exchange or Coinbase or however, desktop wallet, cold storage. And it is, and there's an economic tie between Stacks and Bitcoin. Like in the sense that if there are more smart contracts that are gaining traction on Stacks, the Bitcoin yield is going up for the Stacks holders. Right. So it's a, it's a little bit like, imagine it's a, we, we've seen in, in the crypto industry, this tribalism, especially like, you know, between Bitcoin and Ethereum as well, where some, sometimes you'll see debates like, hey, Ethereum is going to be more valuable than Bitcoin. Bitcoin can just be recreated on top of Ethereum and, and so on and, and the other way around. But Bitcoin has actually never had the capabilities that Ethereum has. It's mostly a passive asset like gold that people are kind of like just buying and it's just sitting there. We are not only bringing the smart contract and app functionality to Bitcoin, we're doing it in a way that is that doesn't compete with Bitcoin. It can grow in harmony with Bitcoin. Like we, Stacks is never going to say that Stacks is going to replace Bitcoin. It's not even possible from a protocol perspective because you need the underlying reserve currency and the reserve asset. 
to actually settle to it, to actually benefit from it. And then Stacks has Bitcoin rewards, right, which are tied to smart contracts. Like in the sense that if smart contracts are taking off, these Bitcoin rewards are going up and people are kind of like, you know, more interested in the long term success of both Bitcoin and and Stacks. Right. So let's let's have that framework in mind and then dig deeper into the Bitcoin community who have they have resistance to new types of assets. Like there are people without naming them who have flat out told me that they love every single thing about this project minus the Stacks cryptocurrency. They, they love everything, right? It's open source, it's decentralized, it's bringing, you know, apps and smart contracts and all this innovation and, and all of that. And, you know, we've, they, they praise even the work we have done on regulations and this and that, but they, they have some sort of a mental barrier to a separate asset. And then I, then I, then I, then I basically walk them through the journey. I'm like, why don't you fork our, our project and run it without, without the asset and basically see what happens? So what would happen is that all this state, for smart contracts that is being secured outside of Bitcoin, no one would have any incentive to store that state. So then you're talking about, can we shove this state back into Bitcoin, which is not going to happen, right? It's a scalability problem for Bitcoin. And then also, I think incentives matter a lot. Like we just launched and and there are miners who are competing over mining blocks. Like we're not in a situation where we are begging people that, hey, can you please come and you know run nodes on this chain just out of the goodness of your heart? Uh, they're doing it because they are financially motivated to do it. And it's the same thing with Bitcoin. How do you think Bitcoin took off? Like it has incentives. It it pays the operators of the network to operate the Bitcoin network. And similarly, you need to pay the operators of, of, of the Stacks network to operate these smart contracts. And I think uh, the, the other interesting angle with Bitcoiners is you would ask them that do you think bitcoin is a settlement layer and they'll be like yes bitcoin is a settlement layer and bitcoin should settle everything in the world i'm like okay great you know stacks settles on bitcoin and if there is a token that is issued on big on stacks that that token also settles on bitcoin so i think there's a little bit of a that uh, like a inner conflict where you cannot at the same time believe that everything in the world should be priced in bitcoin every Things should should use Bitcoin as a settlement layer, and at the same time deny the existence of those assets that should be priced in Bitcoin and should settle on Bitcoin, right? So once you once you start walking through this, like you you you, you see the conflict, and and uh, a lot of and also like I, I I shouldn't say that this is the same reaction from all of the Bitcoin community. Like I think even the Bitcoin community is a spectrum. There's some people who are extremely bullish and extremely helpful and extremely excited about what we are doing. Then there, then there are people who are like, hey, uh, they kind of accept it. They're like, you know, I don't like the token, but I overall, you guys, what you guys are doing is like really beneficial and I kind of like it. And then there's the the extreme form where they're like, the token, I just hate it enough that I'm going to hate the entire project because you have a token. Right. So I think it's a, it's a spectrum. But uh, over time, I think especially with more education, especially when people realize, like imagine how many people are going to discover Bitcoin because they're going to earn their first Bitcoin through through stats or how, or how this is actually making uh, Nick Carter. Uh, I was on a podcast with them. He made a really, really important argument that stacks miners are willing to pay really high Bitcoin transaction fees because the value of a stacks block to them is a way higher than a normal Bitcoin transaction, right? Which is actually a very sustainable model for Bitcoin, especially if if all, all of these Bitcoiners, they would love to see Bitcoin at 50,000, 100,000, a million, right? What do they think is going to happen with Bitcoin fees when that happens, right? Bitcoin fees are going to skyrocket. And to sustain the fee market, the only sustainable path is that you're actually packing so much valuable information in a Bitcoin transaction that it is okay for someone to pay a hundred dollar, thousand dollar transaction fee. Our miners will gladly pay a thousand dollar transaction fee to just get their, just get their transaction in. They, they they actually do very aggressive replace by fee. Like you know, they're always bumping up their their, their fee and updating their transaction because they really really want to get into a a Bitcoin block. And I think long term, like that is the kind of use that can actually justify a very high price of Bitcoin as well because we are packing so much information. I think this is, a, uh, this is a perfect note to end on. I think this kind of sums up your entire offering. 
really nicely. So can you tell our listeners, where should they go to find you and to find information on your project? Yes, yeah, so I think I'm 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 fa fairly active on Twitter, uh, and uh, it's just my first name at Muneeb, M U N E E B, and then uh, the project is on Stacks.co, and and there are actually like multiple entities in the project that you can then discover. I run a developer-focused company called Hero. There is a nonprofit called Stacks Foundation. There is a community-focused entity Freehold. There are mining companies like Daemon and clients like Secret Key Labs or New Intern Labs and so on. So the project has really grown over, over the years. There are, uh, it's, it's, it's very decentralized. It's very much in the, in the cap of Bitcoin. Like it, it shares a lot of the DNA with Bitcoin and is effectively trying to bring more, uh, more innovation to Bitcoin. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on, Munip. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter, and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.